I would like now to bring up my good friend Tom Raffio of the New Hampshire Coalition for Business and Education. So, somewhere along the line, my hair started to get curly, but I know that. But anyway, I knew this day was going to come. I've been at this for, for a decade, and while I have two minutes before I get to introduce Ellen, I'm really hoping that we have some actionable items coming out of today. Um, Scott will handle that towards the end of the day, but we've been talking about this for a decade. Now is really um, the, op the opportunity for us to do something about this. I've been, on the, I've been chair of the Early Learning New Hampshire before Scott. I've been on that board for several years. And everywhere I go, I was recently um, at my Harvard reunion, a lot of famous people, well more famous than me, and it was, the subject was education. Everything came back to early learning New Hampshire. You've heard the science. Uh, later today, you'll hear the business case for it. Um, to invest in, I call it zero to four, uh, we also said zero to three today, but an investment in the early years is so, so, so um, darn important. The New Hampshire Coalition for Business and Education, which comprises several leading business people, all policymakers, educators, we have put our, we, one of our top priorities is early learning New Hampshire. And I must say that my colleagues on the State Board of Education has also embraced the early years. One of our major goals was to um, eliminate the dropout rate in high school, but as you saw from the business case and the quote from David Brooks, the best correlation between success in high school is that investment in the early years. So here's how our endorsement began. The future prosperity of New Hampshire depends on our ability to steward the next generation who will live, work, and lead in our state. We know that success in high school, college, and career is directly related to a successful early childhood. When we as a state ensure that all children have the opportunity to reach their full potential, the next generation will pay that back through a lifetime of productivity and responsible citizenship. So I'm speaking as a chair of the coalition, as a chair of the State Board of Education, also as the dad of four kids who are well-educated, off the payroll, thank God, and they're doing really well. And that investment in zero to four is so, so critical. And I just want to, again, emphasize the importance that we get some actionable items out of today. You know, there's a national organization called Fight Crime, Invest in Kids. Well, you could easily replace those words with grow the gross domestic product, invest in kids, bolster education, invest in kids, and yes, improve dental and oral health and invest in kids. I have to say that so I can have stay employed and keep my real job. But it's true. If the lifetime habits, whether it's oral health, education, all the science that you heard, it, it, it's so important. So simply put, today's event wouldn't be happening without our next speaker, Ellen Galinsky. I also want to thank Jackie Bezos from the Bezos Family Foundation. Ellen graciously donated her time and talent to thinking how we could put on an early childhood event here in New Hampshire like no other before it. I look, I look around the room. This is just simply amazing. I think Ellen has definitely accomplished that. Don't, don't you think? Let's give Don't you? Absolutely. On behalf of the State Board of Education, myself personally, and the coalition, um, I'd like to thank you, Ellen, from the bottom of my heart for, for coming here today. Ms. Galinsky is the president and co-founder of Families and Work Institute. Her more than 100 books, now I've written one book, and I know that was a killer, so I can't imagine writing 100 books and reports include the best-selling Mind in the Making, The Seven Essential Life Skills Every Child Needs, which, we, which we've all received here today. It's awesome. I hope to get it autographed too. And, and, and the flyer that I alluded to was, was underneath that. She is here today to talk about how to spark lifelong learning, a topic, of course, that I have passion for. And I really hope you give your undivided attention to Ellen. And again, actionable items when we complete today's session. Ellen, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, it's, um, I'll, I'll uh, echo the other speakers and say, good morning, New Hampshire. It's like, good morning, Vietnam, remember the movie? Um, but it's not my first time here. I've been here many times over the years, and I'm quite thrilled to be back. In fact, I had the pleasure of working with then Governor Shaheen on um, her agenda for early learning, and it's been quite a success. Um, I'm going to talk about sparking early, lifelong learning, which is uh, very important from a business perspective, and as many of you know, we work with business. Um, my journey, though, begins more than 15 years ago. At the Families and Work Institute, we were doing a study, uh, we've done a series of studies that ask young people uh, how they feel about the pressing issues that they face growing up. We did a study on how they feel about their employed parents. We did a study about how they feel about work in the future. We did a study about how they feel about um, the kind of school shootings that tragically seem to be going on even this weekend. And we wanted to do one on learning. And as we did for all of these studies, we went out and talked to young people um, as we reviewed the literature before beginning the study. And what I, what I heard again and again and again was not just um, a problem with kids dropping out of school and the kind of problems that we've been talking about, but a real problem with kids dropping out of learning. I found when I asked kids to tell me about something that they had learned, they sat there. Um, when I asked them to tell me about something they hadn't learned, they had a lot of enthusiasm. Um, when I asked them why learning was important, they said learning was important so that you can get it so that you can graduate to the next grade, so that you can graduate from school, so that you can get a job and not be a bum on the street or flipping burgers. Now that's really important, but what's missing from that? Passion. Intrinsic motivation. Now I was thinking of these kids because my next door neighbor had just adopted two twins uh, from China. They were eight months old when they came and yet their eyes were sparkling. They were alive with learning. They wanted to see, to taste, to touch everything. You couldn't stop them from learning. And yet we were doing something that other studies have confirmed, that is turning children off from being lifelong learners. And I know from business uh, how critically important it is. So I stopped that study and went on what has become now a 15, 16 year journey I had an opportunity that very few people have ever had, which is to travel around research land across different disciplines and to look at what do we know from the science that can spark lifelong learning, that can keep that fire in children's eyes. So what have we learned, and here I'm going to repeat what Pat and Kathy have said, the importance of the first few years and the architecture of the brain which is being built but I also want to say that we can't stop it. Kathy urged us to talk about zero to three. I want to say we have to keep it going um, after the early childhood years. Um, it isn't too late. We, uh, we can't forget those, those children who are growing up now who are beyond uh, four and five and six. A second thing that is important, and I'm going to come back to this later, is its relationship stupid. It's really all about relationships. The National Academy of Sciences spent a number of years with a group of eminent science reviewing the literature in what turned out to be a book like a doorstop. You ever read it, Neurons to Neighborhoods? Quite a read. Um, quite something to carry around, I'll say, build your muscles. Um, and one of the most important things that they ended up with is there is no development without relationships. So that's really critically important. And then you've heard from both Pat and Kathy the importance of that back and forth conversation with words and without words. In fact, um, Pat makes the very important point in uh, her new research is that we used to think of the brain as a sponge absorbing everything. But when you look at that Broca area lighting up, that lights up through the back and forth interaction that Kathy showed in that adorable um, video of your, of your um, new granddaughter, Ellie. Now I've got to get Zay into one of my videos. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry I didn't bring the video, Zay video today. Uh, that's my grandson, of course. Um, you've heard a lot about executive function this morning. I don't know, how many of you know uh, have, or have heard of executive function before? Wow, a lot. That's fantastic. 
Um, so what are executive functions? They're the top-down neurocognitive processes that are involved in goal-directed problem solving. They bring together our social, our emotional, our cognitive um, capacities um, to pursue goals. Now, you've probably heard them talked about as soft skills, wrong. You've probably heard of them talked about as non-academic, wrong. You've probably heard of them talked about social and emotional learning, wrong. Executive functions bring together our social, our emotional, and our cognitive capacities to pursue goals. If there's anything I want you all to take away from today is you've got to understand that, um, that the brain is all about networks and we don't have learning that's only social, emotionally, and not cognitive. In fact, Pad said to me when I talked to her in 2001, asking her the question, she said the brain doesn't show any evidence of that, that that's not the way, way the brain works. It's um, interconnected, and you saw all those neurons connected. So um, they are um, the capacities that we use, the core processes in executive functions are the ability to hold things in your in your memory uh, so that you can use them. The ability to be flexible, and Pat showed you that wonderful experiment of the child, uh, the bilingual child who is flexible in figuring out how to solve that problem so that you can adapt to changing circumstances and not to go on automatic, but do what you need to do to um, achieve a goal. Those are the brace, basic brain processes, and then those are used as foundations for other skills like uh, being able to delay gratification or to think critically. And it's not just being able to follow directions <clears throat> and sit still. Um, <clears throat> these skills are really important for innovating, and Kathy talked about the creativity gap that are so important. They're the building blocks for school readiness and school success. This is a report from Harvard um, Center for the Developing Child when I think they make the critically important point that kids need to learn the what of learning, content, but they also need to learn the how of learning, learning skills, executive function skills. They're very predictive of academic achievement. Here are three studies that show in random trials that if you can vary the circumstances and you can teach children these skills, they emerge in all of us, but if you actually teach them, um, they're very predictive of academic success. Um, they're also important in dressing. We've talked about the college um, and high school graduation rate and the problems that we have there. Um, this is a study by Megan McClellan. I'm going to take you to her lab in a video in a few minutes. But um, she did a study that got her into this. Uh, it was actually going to be a study of twins, where they were looking at, um, at, at uh, kids who were twins and kids who weren't twins to learn the, nature, the old nature-nurture debate. And they had this weird finding, which is why I love research, which is that the kids who could pay attention, they called it attention span persistence. Researchers always think of very complicated names that will take you a while to learn, attention span persistence. Um, but it means that the kids can pay attention and not be distracted um, and, um, and work to achieve a goal. That the kids who were one standard deviation higher than that when they were four years old were um, almost 50% more likely to graduate from college when they were 25. Amazing, you don't find statistics like that normally. They're also very important of uh, workforce readiness and workforce success, which we've been talking about this morning. In fact, a recent study by the National Association of Colleges and Employers, their Job Outlooks uh, survey, they were asked what are the most important things they're looking for um, in new candidates for the job to work in a team structure, to make decisions and solve problems, to plan, organize, and prioritize work, to verbally communicate. Those are all executive function skills, and we're not teaching them. So uh, my second take home message is that we really need to promote these executive function skills, and I'm going to share uh, how we might do it um, in a moment. Um, this is a study that I really love. This is a study that was done of all of the children born in Dunedin, New Zealand, and they followed them till they were 32 years of age. And they found that the kids who had good executive function skills, particularly self-control, um, were, when they were 32 years old, um, in better health and better wealth, independent of their IQ and independent of their social address at birth or their socioeconomic status. 
amazing study, um, long-term study. So if we're going to make a difference in keeping in promoting school readiness, school success, workforce readiness, and workforce success, if we're going to spark lifelong learning, executive functions are a strong place to intervene because they can be improved. So what I found in my uh, now 15-year journey through research land, I'm just about to write a book on uh, teenagers and executive function skills because it's another period misunderstood the development there is as misunderstood as it was about the early childhood years. And, um, um, and so this is something that we can continue to work on. I think it's going to be very important as our, as our society ages. But what I found um, in these years is that there are seven skills um, that are particularly important, and I'm going to go through each. Focus and self-control is the ability to pay attention, to use our working memory um, so that we can um, solve the problems that we have, to be flexible, and to, to uh, go on automatic. So how do we spark that? What do we do to spark that? I'm going to take you now to Megan McClellan's lab and show you um, some research that she's done. Uh, and one of the things that I want to say is that we spark this by keeping the joy in learning. Those little eight-month-old uh, twins who are now uh, 15, who uh, were my neighbors when they were, uh, came, were adopted and, and came to this country, um, still have a sparkle in their eye. That joy is still there. So we don't, um, when we think about reforming education, we have to think of it as keeping that joy in learning as well. So let's go to Megan McClellan's lab. Okay, so first let's everybody touch your head. This one game that we play, it's really like an opposite Simon Says game. We say touch your head and then touch your toes and then we say okay we're going to be a little tricky and when I say touch your head instead of touching your head I want you to touch your toes and when I say touch your toes I want you to touch your head. So you're doing something that's different from what I say. It really does tap their ability to uh, control their behavior and their body, really. It's remembering the instructions, being able to pay attention, but also switch to a new rule when we add in a new rule, and then have some self, or they call it inhibitory control, where you actually demonstrate stopping and then doing something different. Then you're at more of a natural response. You have to stop and do something that's well, what might be unnatural. How children did on this little task predicted where they ended up at the end of the school year on reading, math, and vocabulary, and it also predicted the gains they made in these academic outcomes. We did an intervention with the Circle of Time games. We randomly assigned children to an um, intervention group or a control group. And then what we did was we helped, we had children for eight weeks go through these intervention games that were similar to these Circle Time games. But each week, each session, they increased in complexity. So they continued to add in new rules. And what we do with red light, green light is we start reversing the rules. And so usually in red light, green light, red means stop and green means go. And so we have them stomp their feet when you see the, when I put up the green, the green circle and the red circle means to stop and then reverse it. So green is stop and red is stomp your feet. <laughs> and then we change the colors. So blue may be clapping and yellow is stopping. And so then we can change the actions and we can reverse those also. It can get quite challenging and I think you have to be a little careful that you proceed sort of gradually into each level so that uh, children get each, each, each rule before you add in a new one. One finding that we have that's pretty exciting is that the children who are low income English language learners in our intervention group demonstrated an additional 10 point gain in math compared to other children in the intervention. So in that experiment, what she found is that, what she found is that um, you play these games, teachers always play circle time games, but you just play these games that promote executive function skills and it makes a big difference. We've taken Mind in the Making, we've turned it into teaching modules we partner with Room, whom you'll hear about from Jackie Bezos later, and with Megan McClellan and Circle Time Games, and we have early preliminary evidence from um, the intervention that we're doing that in six weeks of our intervention, 
kids made greater gains in executive function skills using these three um, interventions together um, in both math and in executive function skills that it takes other interventions six months to produce. So these are powerful little things that you can do uh, to promote skills. Perspective taking means understanding how other people think and feel. Um, it is both beyond empathy. It's, un it's feeling what they feel, but it's also understanding what's going on in the minds of others. And in research that uh, Larry Aber has done, um, he was, he was, he's been worried uh, and spent his career looking at aggression and violence in schools. Again, something that we are all very concerned about, yet um, sadly again. And he found um, that the efforts to teach kids problem-solving skills weren't all that effective. So there was a missing ingredient, again, why he loves research, why I love research. Um, the missing ingredient turned out to be what they call hostile attribution bias. Remember, attention span persistent, this is hostile attribution bias. It means that the kids most likely to get into fights jumped to conclusions about what other kids were thinking and feeling when they didn't have enough information. So they took a literature curriculum, a normal literature curriculum in the early grades of school, and they taught kids to step back and think about the characters. What do you think that character was thinking and feeling? And they found that not only did they improve kids academically, but they reduced violence in the school. Again, these are things that we can do to spark lifelong learning and keep it joyful. Communicating. This is the skill that employers think is missing most in new entrants to the workforce. Maybe it's because we're all on our um, smartphones and tablets, et cetera. But it's something that they're worried about. To communicate, it's beyond literacy. It's figuring out what it is you want to communicate and then being able to, so you have to go on, um, you have to have inhibitory control because you have to really figure out what's most important. You have to prior, prioritize. But then it's understanding how it will be heard. And you've just heard Kathy um, and her colleagues, uh, Roberta Golenkoff and Lauren Adamson, talk about the importance of conversation duets. It takes two or more to do that dance, and these are with and without words. Making connections is the basis of symbolic um, representation. It's the stand for relationship. It's the basis of language, knowing that those sounds and stand for words, knowing that words stand for objects or concepts, or that numbers stand for quantities of things. Making unusual connections is the basis of creativity, something that is critically important um, in a world, as Kathy says, where you can Google for information. It's the people who can see the unusual connections who are going to do well, um, and the people we need in the workforce. Simple games like playing um, shoots and ladders or games like that with kids have been found to improve math ability if you play them in a way that helps the kids understand the math behind the game. That is, if you spin the spinner, and instead of saying one, two, as you're going forward, one, two, but if you're on a square that says six, you say seven, eight, as you move two squares forward. And that helps kids learn to estimate numbers uh, to understand which numbers are bigger and smaller. There's critical thinking. Um, obviously, critical thinking is critical in a world where there's way too much information. And one of the factors that we can do to spark lifelong learning is not answer children's questions too quickly. This is a study by Laura Schultz at MIT, and she looked at who remain curious in life. And what she found was that the people who remain curious um, were the people who kept exploring were when the teachers or the adults didn't jump in and tell kids how those, for example, those boxes that you see uh, there work. Taking on challenges. Um, we do studies of business leaders at IBM and Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase and so forth, and we ask them what's the most important skill that they feel they've ha used to, to get ahead. And it's not just coping with stress, it's taking on challenge, it's trying that hard thing, it's that stretch assignment in the business world that's so important. Um, you learn that in many different ways. Um, um, in fact, um, Carol Dweck has shown that how we praise children makes a difference. If we pay, praise children for their personality, oh, you're so smart, you're, you're really good at math, you're really good at reading, you're athletic, that kids want to hold on to that label and they'll be less likely to try something new or hard. If we praise them for their effort or strategy, 
Uh, we help them both learn to think about their strategy and they'll do better. New research by Stephanie Carlson shows that if we let children pretend, that is if they're trying a really tough or boring kind of a problem, if they pretend to be someone they admire, like Batman or Dora the Explorer for little kids, that they will persist, They've almost, uh, they will be almost a year different in their ability to solve a problem um, by just helping pretend. So play or playful learning is really critical to sparking lifelong learning. And finally, we come back to self-directed engaged learning um, because we need intrinsic and extrinsic learning. Kids need to be lifelong learners. They need to want to learn, to be challenged to learn. And it comes back to relationships. So let me, the last video that I'm gonna show you is Edtronic. Dr. Edward Tronick of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, has devised a way to show how important social connection is to babies and how much it affects them when a connection with a parent or caregiver is broken. First, Dr. Tronick places six-month-old Mackenzie and her mother face to face. He asks mom to talk and play with her daughter the way she normally does. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> Obviously, their connection is strong. The baby is engaged, responsive, clearly emotionally content. <laughs> then, Dr. Tronick instructs the mother to disengage by making a still face. She stays there, but doesn't respond to her baby. Mackenzie is confused at first. She's not used to mom acting like this. Mom turns back but keeps the still face. Mackenzie expects her to re-engage, but when she doesn't, look how the baby reacts. Even at this young age, she tries to entice mom to interact with her. She reaches out. She smiles. She flails her hands. All strategies for getting mom's attention. When that doesn't work, she becomes fussy emotionally agitated. And finally, she just gives up. The meaning of the event is this emotion that the infant is experiencing in relationship to this breaking of the connection in relationship to the mother. And that's a fearful, frightening thing. And the infant will do a lot to try and overcome it. But when they fail, they fail with a sense of helplessness and a loss of control. Dr. Tronick then asks mom to re-engage. It takes a moment, but soon the world goes back to normal for Mackenzie. Now, um, Ed Tronick goes on to say that only about 20 to 30 percent of the time are we in sync with someone else. The important thing is not necessarily being in sync, it's getting back into sync, because it's getting back into sync through which we learn. So relationships are critical to learning. They're as important to us as adults as they are to children of any age, as, as Ed Tronick has shown in, in our studies. So to spark lifelong learning, it's, it's about us. It's not just about the children. I wanna end with actually two stories. Uh, one was uh, I was doing focus groups in Chicago about this study on children and learning. And uh, this is with, a, with seventh grade kids. And one seventh grade boy said, you know, I can tell what kind of year I'm going to have from the moment that I walk into school on the first day of school. And I said, how? What do you, how can you tell? He said, I look at the teacher's face. I said, what are you looking at? He said, I'm looking at her eyes. And I can tell from her eyes whether she likes the kids or not. And I can tell from her eyes whether she likes teaching the, what she's teaching. So if we're going to spark lifelong learners, we've got to be lifelong learners it's the, ourselves. Um, yesterday, I went to a memorial service for an incredible man in my neighborhood. And at the end of um, wonderful tributes about this uh, wildly inventive, creative, talented man, his wife stood up and he said he had unbounded curiosity. 
And that reminded me of Irving Harris, for some of you may know him, he was a very important philanthropist. Um, at his, I went to his 90th birthday, and he said, after all people gave lots of tributes to him, you know, I was lucky that I was born curious and no one took it away. So we want to spark lifelong learning. We have to keep that fire in ourselves and in children. Thank you.